Hello everyone, I am International Master Elect Ardas Tripathi and I would like to welcome you to this course on the concept or as I like to call the art of maneuvering. Now the maneuvering concept is one that is very easy to understand about but extremely difficult to master. In fact, I will summarize the concept in just one line. It is when you take your pieces and reroute it to better and more effective square. That's it. That's maneuvering. However, as we will see in the course, there are so many technicalities. There are so many principles that you need to follow. And more than that, they're not at all easy to find. Even though you feel like you know the concept, it's very difficult to find and implement it during games. And this course is meant to tackle that. Similarly, like we, we talk about weaknesses. Weaknesses are very easy to understand. Weaknesses is basically a vulnerable square or a piece in our opponent's position. But as we all know, it is a positional concept that is extremely hard to master. Basically, in this course, my goal is to tackle that challenge. My goal is to make you a better maneuverer and an overall better chess player. Now, maneuvering as a concept has existed since the beginning of the game because whether or not you do it knowingly or unknowingly, you read out your pieces, whether it's in middle game, opening or end game, doesn't matter. You read out it and you maneuver whether or not, again, uh, if, if that was your choice or not. However, during the chess revolution of 1800s, people actually began studying this concept in detail. They realized there's more to it than just, just a simple definition. We had the likes of the first world champion William Steinitz, we had the, the likes of the American legend Paul Morphy, and several others write, talk, implement, and analyze about this concept. In fact, we'll see few of those no names actually showcase um, the maneuvering concept in some of the examples that we'll see in the course. Now, what is my intention behind creating this course? We'll cover what exactly there is in this course later on, but first let me quickly um, state my mission, the reason why I'm actually creating this course. Now, my in intention isn't that you'll suddenly become a world champion level strategist. I'm not claiming that you will be challenging Magnus Carlsen um, for a one-on-one -on -one strategy battle. However, what I do think is that you'll certainly be able to have a better understanding of maneuvers that happen in the games of the top players, maneuvers that happen um, in, in, in positions like the ones that we're about to see. You'll have a better understanding or, and you'll be able to find maneuvers in your game when required. And I think overall, you will improve your overall positional and strategical skills. Because throughout the course, we will be covering subtopics of maneuvering that also involve the overall theme of uh, chess, like attacking dynamic intentions, positional concepts. So this will be an overall strategy course with the main focus being on maneuvering, which as I said, is a very important part of the game. Now I have a very important priority that I will abide by throughout the course. I will ensure that my explanations are clear and insights are practical and easy to digest and not computer based. Now, this is very important to me. Throughout the course, you will see instances where the, the player that we are witnessing the game of goes for the third best move according to the computer. But the reason why I picked those games also is because I found those moves to be extremely logical and sound. It's not just computer-based top engine move that have been inputted in the course because I frankly think that at the end of the day, we're all humans. At least I hope we're all humans. So at the end of the day, we need to make sure that our decision, our logical thinking is inspired from logic played by top players, logic implemented by grandmasters, rather than just the top line of the computer. I have divided this course into eight parts. It wasn't a hard decision. I mean, eight is the number of, of the chess nodes. We have eight ranks, we have the eight files. Obviously, I'm going to pick um, eight chapters. So, we I, again, I've divided into eight parts. And now we'll briefly discuss those topics so you'll have a good idea of what you can expect as you dive deep into the course content. We'll talk about the chapters, we'll talk about the subtopics and the specifics in this introduction video. Now the first chapter of the course is called Typical Maneuvers. Within this course, you will 
find certain typical maneuvers in the first chapter that you see it in everyday master level game. However, we will have a better understanding of why, what, and when to do those maneuvers. We're going to take a look at classic knight maneuvers in the Italian Roy Lop Italian and Roy Lopez, for instance, which by the way is knight bd2, knight f1, and knight g3. Why does that? To take this knight on the queen side, which usually isn't doing much in these openings, although there are rare exceptions, and you take that knight and you put it on the king's side where it will be more useful. We'll take a look at concepts such as handling a bad bishop. Imagine you have a piece, uh, a light square bishop for instance, and it is blocked by its own pawns. Clearly, we would rather have the bishop control better diagonals than have it all being blocked itself by the pawns, right? We would rather have the bishop be in an open diagonal. We will also see how to handle those bishop, right? So imagine you have a bad bishop. What do I do with it? I cannot use it in the game. I cannot use it, for instance, in an attack. What do I do? Well, I look for ways to maneuver it, right? I look for ways to maneuver that bad bishop into the game. So we'll see some typical um, bad bishop maneuvers. We'll discuss maneuvering the, the queen to the king side. So we'll see some typical examples where imagine your queen is on a3 and you have a full-blown king side attack going on. Without the queen uh, on the king side, it might be a little more stressful handling your attack because you don't have the heaviest piece of them all, the queen, in your attack. So what do you do? You try and find a way to get that queen from the queen side to the king side. Now we're also going to discuss, and this is my favorite, rook lifts. Often credited to the former world champion Gary Kasparov. Uh, he has a legacy of rook lifts um, in his games. We're going to witness certain rook lifts which were mostly for dynamic intentions, but also for strategic weaknesses. For instance, imagine all um, you have all the pawns on the board, you have all the pieces on the board um, on their original square, you don't have the pawn on a4. Imagine your opponent has a weak d7 pawn. How can you put a, possibly attack it? Well, you would go rook a3, rook d3, and attack this pawn on d7. Now, what did you do? You took that rook, lifted it to a3, and then moved it to d3. This entire maneuvering would not be possible without the rook lift to the third rank. So we're going to discuss some typical rook lifts. Then we're going to discuss knight maneuvers, which is of, always a fun topic. So the thing about knights, compared to bishops, they can't move as easily, right? So let's say we go d4, for instance. This bishop has this entire diagonal to move around with, whereas your knight is anyways going to be locked into certain squares. You can't easily move to the king's side, to the queen's side with a knight. You need to hop around with your knight, and then you'll be able to get there. It takes more time, but the added advantage is that a knight can cover both light squares and dark squares easily. So we'll see certain typical knight maneuvers. Then um, the final subtopic of the first chapter is going to be defeating the isolated queen's pawn. If you don't know what IQP is, don't worry, we will examine it in the, in the course. But IQP is basically, imagine that um, this pawn on d4 did not have its colleagues on the c2 and the e2 um, pawns. So there were no pawns on c2 and e2. This pawn would be an isolated pawn, yes. But since it's on the queen's side, uh, so it's on the queen's file, it would be an isolated queen's pawn. So we'll see ways to defeat the IQP. IQP is a very common, uh, common theme because we see it in a lot of different openings. So we're going to see various several different strategies where we try and defeat this IQP. Let us now move to uh, an example from from the first first chapter. Um, this particular example will reflect the example that we will see in the course in the thematic bad bishop maneuver subtopic. That's the second subtopic of the typical maneuvers um, chapter. Now, throughout this introduction video, I will not be featuring the position from the course, but similar positions. I want to showcase the idea that we will be discussing in the course, but I also don't want to repeat things um, in the introduction that I show in the course because I want things to be as unique as possible. Um, and also, if you're the one who watched introduction video, you will learn a lot from this, and then you'll also learn a lot from when we get started with the course. 
Now, let us discuss what's happening in the position. I'm going to flip this position um, for black. Now, this game was played between two grandmasters, two strong grandmasters. You might even have heard the name of um, both of them or at least one of them. Um, if not, that's fine. White player is Grandmaster Boris Shevchenko, Russian Grandmaster, very popular, very strong, who at this point was rated 2638. And his opponent is the exceptionally strong Grandmaster Kara Kamsky, rated 2692 at the time of this uh, match. This game was played in the Baku Open um, in the year 2009, and it's quite an interesting position. If you think about it, Black seems to be objectively better. You have a rook which is on the open file. It is putting pressure on this h2 pawn. Well, you can't capture it because there's a knight on f3, but still, this rook is in an open file. Your pieces are somewhat pleasantly placed, like your knight on f5 is quite nice, but although white's pieces are also quite decently placed, including the queen on g4, the knight on f3, the bishop on d3, they're doing their, their part of the game. Um, however, the biggest, I think, asset in this position is your opponent's king, the white's king in this position, is currently on d1. It is an uncastled king. It is a vulnerable king and obviously it is a target. Whenever there is a king in the center like this and when there are pieces on the board like the queen, you should generally think of ways to try and take advantage of the vulnerable king. Now, although everything sounds good on paper for black, there is a slight issue in this position. The issue is quite simple. Your opponent is threatening pawn captures f6. And this might just seem like a pawn trade. Hey, I can't just go f and e5. Yes, you can. But the problem is that this white knight on f3 will jump to e5. When it gets here, it will be in an outpost square and it will completely dominate the central squares and effectively control a lot of your um, territory. In fact, for instance, let's take a look when, if and what happens when the knight reaches to e5. Certainly, since the pawns get ex got exchanged, this e6 pawn is now a target. If this knight ever moves, this e6 pawn can be in trouble. The knight is threatening knight f7. Now this knight will remain passive because you can't go to g6. The best alternate would probably be to try and trade the knights. But it is clear that this threat of... Um, E into f6 is actually a serious one. Okay, no need to panic. But it is clear that our opponent is threatening something direct. Now, what should we do when an opponent is threatening something direct? One thing is for sure, we cannot just sit there and relax and you know get a drink or something, no. We need a direct, we need an immediate approach in the position. Now, you would love for your pieces, all of your pieces, to participate in an attack, but right now, there are some questions that Black needs to answer regarding some of her pieces. I don't want to give too much away, so before I explain the answer, I want you to try and find the move here for Black. Now, in this position, one thing that should come up into your mind immediately, if it didn't, We'll try and fix this by the means of examining the positions throughout the course. I think you will get better at recognizing these small uh, small issues. But the issue is, this d7 bishop is currently extremely passive. It's like a typical bad bishop in the French defense. It's a typical bad bishop in the Stonewall defense. And whenever there is a pawn on e6 and d5 in general, um, this bishop can get become a bad bishop very easily. Why? Because as you can see, this bishop isn't really controlling anything effective. Right now in d7 it's absolutely horrible, but even then it seems like there are no better squares that the bishop can go to immediately. However, there is a very typical maneuver when the bishop is on d7. And that is the move that you need to play in this position. Because your opponent is threatening something immediate, we as black also need to go for something immediate. The move in the position is bishop e8. 
Now, that goes for a typical maneuver involving the activating of the d7 bishop. In a lot of these openings that I mentioned, the light square bishop is bad and we reroute it via e8 over directly to the king's side via h5, sometimes even on the g6 square. Now, once the bishop will head to h5, in this particular instance, white will be in a lot of trouble because the g4 queen will be under attack, the knight, of, uh, knight on f3 will be uh, under pressure, and also we have direct pressure towards the white king. Now, let's say white disagrees with us or white doesn't understand this. Let's say white plays the move e into f6. Black's move in this position is going to be ignoring this f into e7 threat, but rather go for bishop h5 directly because that was anyways um, an immediate idea. When the bishop reaches on h5, it will attack the queen on g4. Obviously, our opponent wouldn't really like to lose this queen. So let's say they move the queen back. Now, if they move the queen, for instance, to g1, the knight on f3 will hang. So the only two viable squares in this position are h3 and g2. Let's say the white queen goes to g2, which will be a blunder, because now the black knight can go to h4. Just because he activated the bishop, see suddenly how all of your pieces have become active and are taking a huge role in this attack. Now the queen on g2 is under attack again. And the knight on f3 now is also under a lot of pressure. You have the bishop and the knight putting pressure on it. Unfortunately for them, the knight is on f3 is pinned thanks to this bishop on h5, which we are proud of maneuvering, uh, pinning the knight to the king. So they can't go knight into h4. And if they move the queen, let's say anyway, because obviously they will defend the queen, you can simply capture the knight on f3. And this is completely winning for black. So let's say white goes and plays the move queen h3. Now, even here, you could technically go knight g6 and still enjoy a better position. But even better is maneuvering this queen to the king's side via f4. And suddenly realize just how activating one piece, the bishop, helped us coordinate every single piece of ours together. And now the move queen f4 just completely dominates the position. Why? Because we're threatening bishop into f3 check winning the queen after. Now suddenly a queen is activated, the bishop is activated, the knight is playing a major role as we saw in the attack, and unfortunately for white, they're in a lot of trouble. So let's say they realize, how okay, you, you're threatening bishop h5, so let me go e into f6. Okay, sorry, um, so they realize, hey, e into f6 doesn't work because bishop h5, so let me just quickly move the king to c1. That does make sense. Now the point is simple. You will play bishop h5, that's for sure. But the point being, after queen g2, knight h4 isn't as effective because the white knight isn't pinned to the king anymore. So if you play the move knight h4, white can simply capture on h4 here. And now, obviously, black isn't at all, uh, white isn't at all uh, in trouble. After g into f4, they'll go into f6. So now it's, uh, it's another critical time. You have successfully managed to improve your position. Clearly, we prefer this position already compared to what we had um, two moves ago. A bishop being on h5 is really, really helpful. But now it's time also to improve another piece in the position. You have already improved the bishop. Which other piece should we improve? Black to play. Can you find the move? The move in this position is now rerouting this knight on e7, which is a passive piece. Once again, we're always, and I will continue to ask this question um, and discuss this question every single time throughout the course when we have a menu word. And that concept is, that question is, which piece of mind is the worst placed piece? The knight on e7 is doing quite horrible at the moment. It is controlling no significant squares. It isn't doing anything at all. It's just sitting there. But where would it be more useful? Where would it be more effective? Think about it. This f4 square is a weakness that we would like this knight to occupy so that then it can target a bunch of things in our opponent's position. So, black plays the move knight to g6 with the idea of going to f4 with the knight. Now, white in this position cannot allow everything to black so they realized hey let me just at least capture the pawn in f6 and now we finally got this knight on the f4 square 
The knight on the f4 square is attacking the queen on g2, and we're threatening knight into d3 check. They won't be able to recapture with the pawn because of the pin here that the queen has on the white pawn. In the game, already by the way white is in, in a huge trouble because this is a real serious threat so white needs to find a way to move their queen but also ensure they don't lose the bishop if they play a move like queen f1 trying to defend this bishop the knight on f3 will be under attack so the bishop is still being that role of attacking the f3 knight which is a very very important role by the way after knight f4 white then found the intermediate check queen a6, bishop a6 check defending the bishop and after king b8 to ensure that the knight on f3 is protected, they played the move queen h1. Black is already somewhat better, but when all of your pieces are working together in harmony like this, there are going to be tactical solutions and tactical um, ideas pop up immediately. Karakamsky found a very nice little move b5 here. I'm threatening knight, into, knight to d3 check, where the king and the rook will be under fork. I'm also threatening queen b6, which will attack this bishop on a6. The bishop on a6 is trapped. It does not have any good square. And now you might also wonder, what about bishop into b5? Well, that's possible. But now that leaves the c8 square behind. The bishop on a6 was controlling the square. So now we can just jump on c8 with the rook. Notice how a strong grandmaster like Garakamsky is willing to sacrifice a pawn if that means he's able to activate his pieces. So a lot of these strong grandmasters, obviously depending on the circumstance, prefer piece play over material like even as small as a pawn. So in this position, white played the move knight in g5 and black played the move rook c8 anyways, sacrificing the exchange. With the point being after bishop into c8, rook into c8, there are no good ways to stop this checkmate threat. If you play a move like c3, a bunch of new things will pop up, including knight e3 check, and then I might even capture on b2 and then take the pawn on c3. Let's say something like this happens. This is clearly a disaster um, for, for white because queen to c3 is going to come up next. So in the game, white played the move c3, and then knight in d4 happened, and black soon won the game. But the at the end of the day, as I mentioned, if your pieces are working together, if your pieces are well placed, tactics like these are going to pop up immediately, or at least some strategic breakthrough will appear. If not tactical, something strategic is going to pop up if your pieces are well placed. And for that reason, it is essential that we think about improving our pieces and maneuvering our pieces. And again, the typical, just in conclusion, the typical maneuver that we saw in this position was the typical bad bishop maneuver with bishop e8 and bishop to h5. Let's now discuss about the second chapter of the course, which is about maneuvering to coordinate pieces. Now, in this chapter, we're going to focus on examples of maneuvers that improve the coordination of your pieces. You may have your pieces on the best squares, but it won't matter if they aren't working together effectively. Imagine you have a group of three friends and you guys are planning to travel together to in a long, a long, um, um, long drive. So you have a certain goal destination in mind. You guys obviously want to have fun in, in a nice little trip. You have three cars, three different routes. Um, so there are three different routes, all good routes, but you won't be obviously driving three different routes if you're starting from the same place, right? You will coordinate and ensure you travel the same route. So this way you have more fun. Similarly, this is what you do with your pieces. Even if your pieces are all placed well in three different like sides of the board, let's say center, queen side, king side, if they're not working together, if they're not working harmoniously, it isn't really going to get you a nice reward. It isn't really going to help you a lot. So we need to ensure that the pieces are working in harmony in an active and purposeful way. Think of it as giving your pieces the bread and butter synergy. Let's take an example. Let's take a look at an example which showcases this. Here, we have a position from the game of former five-time world chess champion, the one and only Vishy Anand, 
who is renowned for so many things. But one thing that he is renowned uh, relevant to this position is he is considered to be one of the best players of the night. He loved maneuvering uh, his knights and he, he had a lot of examples where he showcased his ability uh, with the knights. But let's discuss um, the position. At the first glance, white's pieces appear to be optimally placed. You have a knight on an a5 square, which is extremely strong, at least from the strategic perspective. It is um, now completely taking control over this weak a5 square. Um, the bishop on d5 is quite strong. It is on an outpost square, controlling um, some, some decent amount of squares. But there is an issue. The issue is, first of things first, your opponent is attacking the a5 knight, which isn't very difficult to, excuse me, which isn't very difficult to deal with. You can play a move like queen e1 if you need to defend the a5 knight. When an even bigger issue is, and I want you to try and answer me this, are the bishops and the knights really doing anything effectively? I mean, sure, the knight is on a5, it looks good. Sure, the bishop on d5 looks good, but are they really serving a purpose? If I had to answer, no, I don't think so. We want, yes, our pieces are placed quite well, but they're not coordinating. They're not working in harmony to achieve a purpose, to achieve a goal. Sure, the bishop is putting some pressure on the f7 pawn, but then black can just go king g7, as we'll see in the game, and there's really not much to do. So, in this position, understanding these, these details, understanding these issues, I want you to now try and figure out the move in this position. Obviously, your opponent is threatening rook into a5. Find a way to deal with that. But also, and this is the most important part of um, the question, try and figure out a plan in this position. Try to play like Wishy did and improve your pieces. Find a plan that coordinates your pieces in a better way. I want you to try and find a plan in this position, not just the move. Okay, all right, so white to play. Now, the move in this position is knight c4. Obviously, um, queen e1 would have hung upon in c2, and clearly we're not that eager to defend the a5 knight, so it's not queen e1. Knight c4 seems like an obvious choice, and it is correct. You defend the knight, but the plan that follows is the real instructive movement. The knight on a5 wasn't doing much. It looked nice on a5, but it wasn't doing much. It blocked this rook's open file. And certainly, as we see, once the knight retreated, this rook is putting pressure on the a6 pawn, and it is on an open file. And so um, we solve one issue. We're also threatening knight into d6. Let's say black plays the move h5. We have this nice tactical idea with knight into d6, sacrificing the knight, with the point being that queen into d6 will uh, help us win the queen because we have a nice discovered check with bishop into f7 check, winning the queen later. However, that's not the main goal as um, Wishy Anand is playing against uh, another strong grandmaster, um, Luke Van Willey, who is obviously going to find that. But as I said, the key is about the plan, which I will reveal in just a second. Black played the move king g7, uh, simple prophylaxis, preventing the opponent's idea, that's prophylaxis, preventing knight in d6, because now queen into d6, bishop into f7 will not be a check, so black would be able to simply retrieve their bishop. Now, this is really the question I was trying to ask in the beginning. What is white's plan, right? I asked that question for one specific reason. Wishy, when he played the move knight c4, already had a plan in mind he realized that his pieces needed better coordination to maintain his stable advantage. He then recognized something very, very important in this position, which I wanted the viewers of the course to try and find, and that is reversing the position of the knight and the bishop is key in this position to find a, a, men, a, a, find a coordination between your pieces. So, when the bishop gets to c4, it will be able to attack this a6 pawn, and a knight will do much better on d5 than the bishop was. Why? Because the knight will be on an outpost square. So, now that we know that, can you find out how white can achieve that? 
If you did already, good job. If you didn't, how do we achieve that? It's our turn. So can you find a way to reverse the placement of your pieces? Let's say put the bishop knight on d5, put the bishop on c4. Well, we should play the move knight b2. It is a knight retreat. It is a retreating to, it is a backward retreat. So you might go, wait, are we actually supposed to retreat our pieces backwards? Well, in certain cases, yes, if the goal is not just to retreat it backwards, but rather to reroute it to a better square. Sure, the knight on c4 was doing just fine, but the issue is not just that. Again, we're not just thinking about one piece, but we're thinking about all of our pieces. If you don't put the knight on b2, or if you don't really vacate the c4 square, this bishop is going to be on d5 forever. And we really don't want this bishop on d5 because it isn't doing much. We would rather have this bishop on c4. So that's why we're playing knight b2. Wishy vacates the c4 square for the bishop. And the point is, after black plays the move like f5, which happened in the game, Wishy gets his bishop on c4. Suddenly, the a6 pawn and the rook are under attack and the rook is now having complete control of the semi-open farm. Now, after bishop c4, black played the move rook c5, pointing out that if you go bishop into a6, winning a pawn, black will be able to play rook into c2, attacking the queen and the knight. So obviously we're not hungry for a pawn, we don't need to capture the pawn on a6 immediately, but it's still true that the bishop on c4 now is serving a purpose, putting pressure on the opponent's weakness, the pawn on a6. And with it, we actually see that the queen and the rook are also coordinating with the bishop. So we have three pieces that became suddenly active um, because of this bishop retreat. And they're all coordinating to put pressure on the a6 pawn. White now played the move knight a4. And this is the final key to get a knight to d5. Knight a4 attacking the rook, rook to c6, and knight c3. This is a much better and more coordinated setup than what we began from. White is much happier here than they were a few moves ago. As the placement of the rook on a1, the queen on e2, and the bishop on c4 work really well together, putting significant pressure on the a6 pawn. Additionally, this knight will head to the outpost on d5. And now, as we all know, knights excel in outpost squares. While white's advantage is only slight, wish he converted it convincingly well, which showcases how difficult it is to deal um, with a coordinated set of pieces. And we can understand why Grandmaster Van Willey was not able to handle this as black um, um, easily. Now, move to the third chapter of the course, which is maneuvers with the intent to target opponent's weaknesses. Now, in the beginning, in the starting of this video, I mentioned that weaknesses are uh, vulnerable squares or pieces in our opponent's position which we would like to which we would like to put pressure on right that's weaknesses but basically we also need our pieces in in certain squares to actually target those weaknesses without it we can't just randomly attack those or put pressure on those weaknesses the title of the chapter I think is pretty self-explanatory but to elaborate when your opponent has a weakness your goal is to make their life as difficult as possible and apply pressure on that weakness at the right moments. You're not always looking to win immediately, but rather to gain a slight edge, both in the position and psychologically. You want to squeeze that weakness, put as much pressure as possible on that weakness. The key, as we'll see in the examples, is to time your actions correctly and place the right pieces in the best positions. Let's take an example uh, of a position in this chapter. Here we have a well-known figure from the early 1900s, leading Austrian player Karl Schlechter, showcasing a brilliant example of exploiting an opponent's weakness. This game was played in the year 1905, which is a very, very long time ago, but still it showcases that this concept is universal. It had been applied ages ago, it is being applied now and will continue to be applied throughout the course of the chess game. Now, let us discuss what is going on in this position. It's pretty clear, so we have equal material here. That's the first thing you should think uh, when looking at this position. The second thing is it seems that black has decent amount of control on the light squares. 
right? Since all of their pawns are on the light squares, they all seem to do a fairly decent job controlling the light squares. So I don't think that's really where uh, black is struggling. They have enough control on the light squares. Okay, if that's the case, then what about the dark squares? Well, that is where we see certain issues in the position. Arachnid's dark squares are, are quite weak and vulnerable because of this pawn chain being all on light squares. Squares such as h6, g5, g7, d6, b6 are all vulnerable squares that, if possible, white would like to occupy. That's not the end of it. I think black having this bishop on c8 is also a bad thing for them because it's a bad bishop. And there is no simple way to maneuver it like uh, what we saw in the typical bat, uh, bishop maneuver. Okay, well, as white, just knowing that our opponent has weaknesses and issues does not mean that we have won the game. We need to find a way to take advantage of those weaknesses. Okay, I want you to ask two questions to yourself, after which you will have the answer. The first question is, First things first, which piece of yours isn't doing much? Need to answer that. The second question is, find a plan to activate that piece while trying to take advantage of your opponent's weak and vulnerable squares. Trying to adva take advantage how? By occupying those weak squares. Why to play? What do you think should Carl play here? The move in this position is knight g1, knight d1. I should quickly mention that you would love to play the move g5 here to completely dominate over on these dark square weaknesses, but black has the move queen f5, which slightly improves the placement of this queen, offers a trade, and if the queens are not on the board and let's say a trade happens, this becomes too blockade-ish, and now I don't think uh, white's probability of winning are too high. So we don't really want to blockade everything so easily. But white realized that if I play knight d1, a backwards retreat again, I improve this piece on knight on c3, which wasn't doing much, and it will head to e3. After which, playing g5 will mean that black has no queen f5. I should quickly mention, yes, the knight on c3 is perhaps helping you with the potential threat of b5 in the future. But you got to ask yourself, yes, even though I have a plan or a threat, how realistic is it? I don't think it's that realistic because black has enough resources to prevent this b5 push. And more importantly, opening up the board is only going to help the side with the bad bishop. So we're not really going for the b5 push. So what is really the point of this knight on c3? So white plays the move knight d1 with the idea of going g5, knight e3, knight g4 and then occupying these weak and vulnerable dark squares and again the the chapter's title was maneuvering to take advantage of our opponent's vulnerable squares to, to take advantage of our opponent's weakness and that's exactly what this move intends on doing after the move rook g7 i played the move knight e3 queen e7 and we finally get the move g5 the rest is quite simple as you can guess Carl Schuster got his knights on these dark squares. Bishop d7, knight 3g4, knight at 6 check, and queen e2. The reason why um, Carl played the move queen e2 is actually also very interesting. So the two pieces that weren't doing much, the knight and the queen, are now being rerouted to take advantage of the dark squares. What do you think is Carl trying to do with this queen on e2? Any guesses? Well, the point of this is quite simple. I want to redirect this knight to the f6 square and then occupy this other weak square on e5 with the queen. So I'm trying to maneuver my queen from c2 to this weak vulnerable e5 square. Black played the move queen d8, white played the move knight e g4 with the idea of queen e5 in this position. Black played the move bishop d7, and now we occupy this e5 square completely. Again, there is no rush. As I said, not all weaknesses are meant for you to just take advantage of win the game immediately. Some weaknesses, like dark square weaknesses in this position, are just meant for you to improve your pieces and make your opponent's position as much as possible to be a living hell. 
You're squeezing those weaknesses in the position, occupying it slowly, one by one, taking your time. You can also do maneuvers of this nature because the position is closed, right? If this was, let's say, a dragon game with a bunch of attacking stuff going on, you might not have the time to do th things like this. But since this position was a closed position, you can take your time to do maneuvers like this. Black played the move knight e8, white played the move knight h3, and after the black move to c7, queen c7, white finally maneuvered this knight to f6, and you have your pieces optimally placed. Soon there will be a tactical shot, but one thing is for sure, white is completely dominating in the position, and white won the game um, soon after. So we start from this position, already quite good, but we're still not there. And in this position, at the end, it seems that we're ready for the final tactical show shortly. But again, it was quite simple. I'll again just, in, just I'll just conclude this very easily. Our opponent had weaknesses. We had the time um, to maneuver around. We had a piece which is, wasn't doing much, the knight on c3. We tried and we found a way to maneuver it to our opponent's weak squares. And that was it. As simple as that. So that's what we'll take a look in the third chapter. Now the fourth chapter involves maneuvers with dynamic intention. We know that maneuver is a strategic concept, but as we also know, great attacking or tactical games often include strong strategic decisions and moves. In this chapter of the course, we will explore examples where one side maneuvered a piece from a passive position, although it may or may not be passive, to a more aggressive one, to a more potentially um, damage-inducing one, where it can be used to sacrifice or launch an attack. Let's take an example um, uh, on what sort of position we will be taking a look at. Okay, this is a very exciting game played by Maestro of Chess, former world champion, the one and only Gary Kasparov himself. Against an attacking legend in her own right, uh, Judith Polker, this was played in the Y Z 2000 tournament. Gary Kasparov was uh, playing from the white pieces, had a rating of 2851. And Judith Polker, um, the great Judith Polker, um, was playing from the black pieces with a rating of 2658. Now, what's really interesting about this um, example and the reason why I decided to put this is it's a combination of three types of maneuvers that we'll take a look in the course. Maneuvers done with the intention of coordination, maneuvers to target our opponent's weaknesses, and maneuvers with dynamic intention. When you take a look at the position, one thing quickly appears. Um, white has a slightly poor pawn structure, no denying in that. And we have one really poor piece in the position, really bad piece. I don't want to give away too much. I want you to first find the best move for white in this position, and again, not just the move, please a plan too. How should Gary continue? The move in this position is pawn to c3. It's such a simple move, it just seems like it's, it's a, yeah, I just took that pawn played on c3. But there's a lot of interesting things going behind the scenes with this move. This is a very simple yet powerful move in the position. White's pressure on b3, as I said, was the back piece that I was talking about. It's a horrible piece, completely dominated by his own pawns, no good diagonals, no good squares to go to. And so you just create a square for the bishop to retreat to, maneuvering this bishop to c2, where it will be able to attack, excuse me, it will be able to attack the opponent's weak squares, the light squares on the king's side, that is the opponent's weaknesses. And then, that's not it, you will then join um, the attack with the queens. The queen and the bishop will basically coordinate together after bishop c2 and queen d3 for a potential attack. So we covered maneuvering um, aimed at coordinating pieces. We had bishop and the queen now suddenly coordinating together, targeting the opponent's weakness. Many was done with that intention. Suddenly, we're all targeting opponent's weak light squares. And obviously maneuvers with dynamic intentions because when the queen reaches on d3 we will have sacrifices like rook into f6 followed by queen at 7 check um 
this now is uh, a very difficult position to deal with as black. The computer thinks that this position is better for black. It is understandable they have the better pawn structure. Black has moves like bishop b5. But the way Gary plays from here makes it somehow feel that the evaluation should be the other way around. And again, when you're open plays a move like c3 and they have these dynamic intention, it is not at all easy to tackle tackle the situation. The best move in this position is actually bishop b5, uh, aimed at sort of restricting this maneuver. You can't go queen d3 anymore. Jitpulga didn't go for it. It is also understandable why she didn't go for it, because once you go bishop b5, this f5 square becomes quite vulnerable, then maybe queen g5 ideas. So she didn't go for it. She plays the move a5 and queen d3. Um, Gary realized he shouldn't give um, Judith the time to go bishop b5 and plays the move queen d3. After a4, bishop c2, and we're all set for a sacrifice on f6 followed by queen at 7 check. That's what happened in the game. Queen c5, rook into f6, e into f6, queen at 7 check, king f8. Now, since this knight is under attack, we play the move knight d4 with a very simple idea. Let's say you capture the pawn on c3. I will just first defend this bishop, although I can maybe even play bishop f5 directly. But let's just, for the uh, sake of example, go king h2 and let's say black plays a3. This knight is going to be very useful because now we're going to play bishop f5. Trade the bishop, let's say black doesn't trade, we trade the bishops and go knight f5. We have a huge threat here, we're threatening queen g7 checkmate, this bishop has no good square and black is all done for. So knight d4 was played and again, all of this dynamic sense got created in the board thanks to c3, bishop c2 and queen d3, which was the key part of the, of the game. The game continued, rook e5, but I'll keep my analysis brief here because again, the the original the, the continuation um, that we saw in the beginning was what really our focus is in this in this um, course. So bishop into e5, f into e5, and now obviously once you maneuver your pieces, coordinate them, you're going to have tactical um, tactical ideas like it happened in the game. Knight e6. If you go f into e6, rock f1 check comes through, and then I'll pick up the g7 bishop once the king moves. Bishop into e6, d into e6, and after rook c7, bishop into a4. In this position, although the material uh, is right now equal, um, clearly black's king is way too vulnerable. And after d5, queen f5, Gary won the game at the end. Uh, he played the move like bishop d7 and got his rook on f1 and won this game quite, quite, very, uh, quite nicely. But again, in conclusion, when you have a bad bishop, um, and in general, in positions like this, where it's strategically worse, you gotta think about ways um, that you can play the game dynamically. And here, Gary showcased and explained to us, hey, this bishop wasn't doing much, I know maneuvering, I will reroute this bishop for dynamic purposes. Although, as we discussed, three maneuvering were all uh, showcased with this maneuver. Chapter of the course is quite simple. Maneuvers with the intention to trade with better pieces. Again, the title itself is self-explanatory. In any given position, you want to neutralize your opponent's stronger piece using your weaker piece, right? Let's say I have a slightly bad piece or I have a bad piece. I'm obviously going to look for ways to trade it with my opponent's decent or, if possible, good piece. These maneuvers, um, like the one we'll see in the example following this, will basically have that specific intention in mind. This is a very fun position, played between two grandmasters in the Abu Dhabi Open 2003. Two 2500s uh, playing against each other. White has a nice space advantage, and it's clear that white is slightly better here. There is a problem in this position. I first of all answer me this: which piece of white is a bad piece? I would argue that the worst piece in this position is the d3 bishop for white because it is restricting the rook. It is an overall bad bishop, and it isn't really doing anything useful. Okay. Now my question is: Can you find the move in this position, like white did, that masterfully decides to solve this issue? The move in this position is knight 
G1. Not the engine's best move, but a very challenging move to face as a human. The point of this move is quite simple. I want to go bishop e2 and bishop f3, trade my poor bishop with this absolutely strong bishop on the b7 square. Now, backward maneuvers like knight g1 are always tricky to spot, but rewarding when found. White's knight anyways wasn't re uh, doing much, contributing much, so it, it we're quite all happy just moving it to g1. Um, it will anyways improve once we are done with the trade. Stronger grandmasters always strive to play according to the principles, and this is a great example of that. Again, not the best according to the computer, but as I said in the beginning of the course, our aim is to find logical moves, understand how grandmaster thinking works, not how computer thinking works. Knight g1, bishop, and at that, for that reason, I've given this move an exclamation mark. I really enjoyed um, this position and the way white played. Knight e8, and obviously now you know the move, bishop e2, a5 and bishop f3 saying hey you know what buddy if you trade the bishops i'll be very happy but if you decide not to we'll have to go to an even worse square and then my bishop will be the one which is quite active black played the move d6 and white just uh stayed there for a while there is no reason for us to trade our bishop is now actually quite all right because it was on d3 it was bad now suddenly on f3 the bishops are looking at each other both the bishops are quite fine no rush to trade but after a couple of trades um white won the game quite nicely bishop into g1 king into g1 bishop into f3 g into f3 i mean just from this position onward it is quite clear that although white is not winning just like in this position it's clear that sooner or later white will improve and white will have a much better position why because our opponent's uh, pieces are quite worse and we traded off the bad piece that we had piece or pieces although i have another question for you black goes rook a7 i want you to maneuver one more piece in this position and improve its placement can you find the move if you're thinking rook a d a2 i agree with you that's one of the maneuvers that we should think for obviously want your rooks to be doubled up but white plays an even better again these are grand masters the heat knows that there is no rush for rook e2 d2 so instead he plays move bishop f6 mentioning that instead of g5 the bishop will perform much better on the central square on e5 and after knight h5 bishop e5 white's pieces are completely dominating the position and white won the game at the end i hope you enjoyed this example i did at least when i saw the move knight g1 the sixth chapter of the course focuses on some end game maneuvers while one can talk about this this particular topic for hundreds of hours and still not be done um, I have tried showcasing some typical examples that showcase that. So this was uh, a game that got future. That this was a game that was played in uh, in the year two thousand eight between two strong uh, super grandmasters, the former world champion Wesling Topolov, and one of the great players that uh, were played at the elite level for a while and is still playing and never unfortunately became a world champion, although they did play like one, um, Levon Oronian. So, in this position, we can see that uh, Levon Oronian offered a trade of rooks. The rook on the second rank is putting pressure on the e2 bishop. If you go bishop into d7, unfortunately, that's not a free rook because I can go rook into e2. If you go rook into d2 and accept the trade, after rook into d2, your opponent is going to be the one having complete control over the second rank. We also don't want to allow that. So, in this position, um, Tupola follows a very important principle, which I want you to try and think. So, why to play? What do you think is the move in this position for Tupola? And not just that, please create a plan here. Now, in this position, the issue is, in this position, if you play the move rook into d2, rook into d2, your, queen, your king is quite tied to the g1 square. Your king, unfortunately, is uh, in a very tricky situation. So, instead of that, you should first go king f2. Get the king out. King is a king in endgames. It's a fundamental principle, one I first heard when I started playing chess and was seven-year-old. And it's something that chess players follow 99% of the time. 
From this point onward, Topolov accurately maneuvers his king to the queen's side and later he redirects it to the king's side, making his decisions based on the situation at hand, although we'll see it now. After rook 75, um, Topolov realized that, hey, my opponent's rook are quite active. Let me trade a pair of rooks. But why, I, I want you to try and answer this question. Why did this trade work before? <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, why did this trade work for black better previously and why is it not that good now? Well, previously, because after rook into d2, rook into d2, the black rook was preventing this white king. And so after rook into d2, rook into d2, the white king is able to go king e3. It's no longer stuck. And that was the key maneuver to get the king out and active. After rook a2, Wesleyan Topolov got his king to d4, activating the king. And then he got his king over to the queen's side, maneuvered his king to the queen's side. And this is what I mean. The king is the king of endgames. Don't take this lightly. Without your king participating in, in, in an endgame, it's very rare that you will be able to win easily, especially in normal positions. If your opponent's king is more active, they hold better chances in any normal position. Black played the move rook a1, trying to be still behind the passed pawn. But now that we have the king, we have no reason to worry. We can just kick this rook away from the A file. Black played the move rook e1 and white played the move rook c5 attacking the pawn g5 um, and also preventing rook e5 in case let's say you go a5 this is rook e5 so why even allow that rook c5 king f6 a5 and now the black pawn proceeds uh, forward in an endgame. What's even funny is now one of white's winning ideas is king b3 king b4 king a5 king b6 attacking the knight. If the knight had to move, they have no good square because then white will be able to promote to a queen. So um, Wesleyan Topolov uses this advantage of, of this threat to ensure that the black king does not go to f4 and g3. Because if you try doing that, my king will be on b6 attacking this knight. And then I'll just simply promote once the knight moves. So black played the move king d6, bishop b7, king c5. Again, Topolov is in no rush to promote because again, he's, need be, no, he's not being forced to promote. And so he would like to maintain this king b6 threat as much as possible. Why? Because his king is quite far away from um, the king's side. So if I just promote to a queen, for instance, after knight into a8, bishop into a8, there is a sense of danger of the black king joining and your king being too far away to defend. So in this position, realizing that this is happening, this is where the key moment also comes. Another critical moment. White's move in this position, can you guess what it is? It's king c2. Maneuvering this king over to the king's side to ensure that the king is there when required for defensive purposes. Now, once the king joined, Topolov managed to get his king on the king's side and then promoted to a queen. Now that the king is on the king's side on e3, there is no reason to worry. And in the game, uh, after a couple of moves, um, Topol have managed to win the game quite easily. If you go g into h4, f6 check, we'll block and pick up this pawn on h4. So king d5, captures, captures, bishop c8, king e5, and now black is in zugzwang after bishop d7. Thanks to, again, your king. If your opponent goes g4, I will have f4 check. The pawns are locked in. They will at some point... Uh, be captured by the white bishop and if you go f4 check king d3 I will just put my bishop on g4 and then start to chase the pawns Unfortunately for black they won't be able to push forward with the pawn and again So this was a very crit critical and important lesson activate your king Many were your king and activate it and involve it in the in the end game in the in your whatever it is attacking ideas or the defensive ideas we saw the king joined the party for attacking purposes for um, aggressive purposes like king b2 it joined to get out this rook out and then we also saw the king join for some defensive purposes with king e2 all right the seventh chapter of the course uh, and this penultimate uh, chapter of the course will focus on games known for their brilliant maneuvers. These games will be both exciting and highly instructive. The reason I dedicated an entire chapter to this is simple. Throughout the course I wanted to feature not so popular but more typical games to demonstrate how relevant the, the concept of maneuvering is. It's not a concept that occurs in only on famous games but it's a universal concept that happens in everyday games. And my goal was to select those everyday games.
However, obviously if we're doing a maneuvering topic, we got to show those famous iconic games and that's what this seven chapter is all about. I won't be showcasing an example because I want to save those for the, for the course content. The final chapter of the course, the eighth chapter, is I think a chapter that will tie everything together. This chapter is all about exercises that I'm going to prevent, present to you. This is the test chapter. I will be giving you cues. Then you will have to carefully evaluate, assess the position, trying to find out the answer on your own before checking my explanations. I think this is going to be a fun ride. We're going to take a look at a lot of maneuvering exercises throughout the course. But I think um, what I've tried to do is present something exciting for every chapter. So you'll be learning everything after every other diagram that we discuss and um, um, interact with. I hope you enjoyed um, this this lecture. I hope to see you in the in the course. And I hope that after all of this, you will become a better strategic chess player. Thank you and bye.